All right, and I want to close here with a kind of a discussion of regional variation. Um, the extensive amount of archaeology that's been done um, in Upper Mesopotamia and Greater Mesopotamia since the emergence, uh, the outbreak of the first Gulf War, uh, when southern Iraq was largely closed off to archaeological excavations by foreigners, um, has shown a wider amount of variation um, in the Ubaid tradition. So we kind of see it as this monolithic. Um, culture, it's oftentimes referred to this as um, this, but the reality is that we see this as something that is much more fluid and dynamic for local communities. And I want to kind of outline some of these changes, right? So decorative motifs vary widely on ceramics. Um, so for example, in the upper Tigris River Valley, these concentric circles in the negative, using the negative space, right? So most Ubaid pottery has the designs in the paint. Um, here, but in the Upper Tigris River Valley, we see this concentric circle design where the, the circle is created in the negative. So you paint everything black and leave the detail in white um, through this. And that's something that is relatively unique. Um, it's found at a couple of sites like Salat Tepe and Yena Jayani, um, as well as Kanan Tepe in the Upper Tigris, but it's found very rarely outside of this uh, region. Um, the other thing we saw is that at Diermen Tepe and at Kanan Tepe, um, in Anatolia, we see signs of agglutinated tripartite architecture. So they're kind of mapping on those uh, shared walls that are characteristic of the Anatolian Neolithic, but they're building houses in a tripartite style, um, which shows a, a different uh, association. It's a, taking the standard form of the Ubaid, but applying it to a uh, lived and personal experience of architectural aesthetics uh, for uh, Anatolian societies. The other thing we see is in southern Mesopotamia, these clay molars and sickles um, are found at just about every site, but they're rare in northern Mesopotamia. And that's because objects are, be are more readily made in flint and basalt. Um, they're more common. So you don't need to make objects out of clay when you have readily available work stone to make grinding stones and sickles out of. And finally, those Ophidian figurines, those uh, uh, reptilian-like structures we see at Ur and Eridu um, in the cemeteries there, um, rarely occur outside of the southern alluvium. Uh, a couple of examples of conical-headed uh, coffee bean dyed uh, figurines have been found in the north, one at Kanan Tepe and one at Tel Kurdu, uh, both in modern Turkey, but they're, they're rarely found. So we have the incorporation figurines are primarily made in local styles that much more match the Halaf and Neolithic styles of northern Mesopotamia. So what we can kind of see is that Ubaid inhabitants, Ubaid peoples, uh, rather than kind of wholesale adopting all of this from southern Mesopotamia, um, adopted what fit and worked for their communities. So we kind of think, see this, I think, um, in this sense, very much like what Nissen and Stein and Ozbal were talking about, is that it's a movement of ideas, strategies, and aesthetics um, that were occurred through interregional contact and exchange, but that this, I, these ideas were varyingly adopted and adapted to meet local needs. So you can kind of think of it like a, a tradition or a culture a la carte, where local communities picked uh, the parts that worked best for them and their needs within this, but also socially signaled them as belonging to this broader um, interaction sphere of groups of people engaged in long distance trade of obsidian and copper and basalt and diorite and all these materials as they're flowing throughout uh, greater Mesopotamia at the time. And then I want to leave you with this, right? It's kind of ideas about the Ubaid period in Greater Mesopotamia. So in, in the Southern Alluvium, at sites like Tel Abada and at uh, Eridu and Susa, we see markers of social political complexity. That is public architecture, these platforms, niched and buttressed temples. Um, and outside of Garwa and possibly Tel, De Zel Tel Zaydan, temples are absent in Northern Mesopotamia. We also see the intensified use of administrative tools such as seals and ceilings, um, multi-tiered settlement patterns. Um, people have argued that we see Ubaid uh, settlement patterns around sites like um, Tel Ahawa and Tel Brock um, that mimic those that we see in the southern Mesopotamia around Ur and Eridu. However, most of our sites are remain primarily small scale, uh, about one hectare with a small village population. They're relatively evenly spaced across the landscape. 
Um, and then the painted pottery, copper objects, and figurines, all as prestige items in burials. So unlike the Ur Eridu and Susa regions, we see very little evidence for these markers to suggest socio-political complexity in the north. The best evidence comes from the temples at Tepe Garwa, but remember their function could be represented as a ceremonial site and debated based on the presence of domestic artifacts. So archaeologists have kind of generally assumed that the Stein staple finance model uh, for the chiefdoms in southern Mesopotamia can be more or less mapped onto northern Mesopotamia. And Stein has uh, argued that this happens implicitly um, through the transmission of these ideas. However, most sites in the north are relatively even disper evenly dispersed in size and location, and our seals and ceilings are usually found in domestic contexts and show little differentiation in their glyptic design. So it doesn't necessarily look like we have any kind of centralized institutions, even at sites like Tepe Garwa, where we have the temple that are controlling access to these resources. And that's led a lot of archaeologists, including Peter Ackermans and Frank Hohl, to argue that the Obeid society was characterized by an ethos of egalitarianism, and that this persisted primarily in the Obeid in northern Mesopotamia, um, and with very little social differentiation or complexity, operating at these Obeid sites. So what we can kind of look at is the, the steps that are being taken towards the consolidation of power at a site like Eridu are not being taken into account or not trans, uh, translating with the spread of those ideas and ideology of Ubeid society into sites like Deiram and Tepe or Kenan Tepe. And that might be a reflection of the very specific local communities uh, that we see in Ubeid Mesopotamia, or it might be uh, just a recognition that the positions of authority that we see may not have been as well stratified or has entrenched as we would like to think that they were um, based on our understanding of the subsequent Uruk period, that we still may be missing some of the stages of this development, or that that development happened relatively rapidly and is in some ways unconnected or not related to the developments in the Ubaid. Um, this is one of the most fascinating uh, things about this period for me as an archaeologist and why my research is focused on it. Um, either way, I think it kind of uh, sets the stage for future excavations um, at sites all throughout Greater Mesopotamia to be able to answer this question.